that's one of the other reasons why I, I think I wanted to do this story was because, you know, as a, as a writer, I try to do work that is original and um, that adds to the conversation. And I saw a big story here that wasn't being reported. Yeah, I saw little pieces of of things that were that that could add up into a different alternative narrative to what we were all being told is the official story. The official story had been endlessly repeated, mm -hmm. but there was this whole other side, including from Army Hammer himself, his side of the story. But there were these other things, right? Like there was Elizabeth Chambers, you know, colluding with the main accuser. Uh, there was the fact that Gloria Allred dropped Effie as a client. That was something that was reported by another media outlet. I think it was Us yeah. Weekly reported it months before I did my story. That, to me, was one of the main uh, impetuses for me to pursue this. What is up, everyone? This week, I sit down for a thrilling two-part episode with James Kerchick. James Kerchick is a columnist for Tablet Magazine, a writer at large for Airmail, and author of the instant New York Times bestseller, Secret City, The Hidden History of Gay Washington. A widely published journalist and historian, he has reported from over 40 countries, and his writings have appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, the Los Angeles Times, the Atlantic, Rolling Stone, and many other publications in the United States and around the world. In other words, he's an absolute savage of a writer. For the first part of this episode, James and I discuss his interview piece with Army Hammer titled Army Hammer Breaks His Silence, published by Airmail in February of 2023. This is the first and only interview given by Army Hammer since he was accused of sexual abuse and cannibalism and then blacklisted from Hollywood. James's long-form interview with Army Hammer, which is a 30-plus minute scintillating read, caught my attention because almost no one else in the media was reporting the full story told by documents, medical records, texts, and testimony revealed in James's write-up. Is journalism no longer about uncovering the raw truth, no matter where it leads? In Army Hammer's case... It was not. James put in the hard work that other quote-unquote journalists refused to do, even if it meant going against the mainstream narrative. We dive into evidence that shows how Elizabeth Chambers, Hammer's now ex-wife, colluded with the main accuser Effie, at House of Effie on Instagram, why the cannibal accusations are unfounded and ridiculous, the shortcomings and negligence of the House of Hammer documentary, texts from Hammer's accusers that paint a completely different story than the one portrayed by the mainstream media, a hashtag me Too NFT minted and sold by one of Hammer's accusers, the origin of Hammer's interest in BDSM, medical records that cast doubt upon the sexual abuse allegations of one of the main accusers, and more. For the full scoop, please go check out Army Hammer Breaks His Silence by James Kerchick on Airmail. It's linked in the description of this episode and walks through the evidence step by step in a way that's just not possible to do in a single conversation. But still, we cover a lot. So buckle up. The second half of the episode covers James Kerchick's book, Secret City, The Hidden History of Gay Washington. We discuss how homosexuality became intertwined with the heightened threat of communism, the purge of gay employees from the federal government, the lavender scare, the courageous story of Frank Kameny, the plot to out Reagan as part of a clandestine homosexual cabal, and the through lines between the cancellation of Army Hammer and the gay men in Washington who had their lives and reputations destroyed. I could not believe how much homosexuals in government shaped each presidential campaign of the 20th century, all while having to live double lives for fear of having their lives ruined. Now, without further ado, please enjoy this week's episode with James Kerchick. The, uh, the Army Hammer article that you wrote mm. absolutely blew me away. Really? I, so, I succumbed to believing a lot of the hype around the documentary the house of hammer when it first came out and did you watch it i did watch a couple of episodes and i i read a few write-ups on it and about a week after i watched the documentary i just thought like there has to be other another side to this it just like it, it doesn't feel right and and also just like watching a netflix documentary i feel like in the moment they're so good at pulling you in and making you believe that like this is the only point of view that ever could have happened this wasn't netflix netflix though i think it was discovery uh, discovery yeah i think it may be on netflix i think now, it went on or maybe it's netflix. on hbo now i don't i don't know i think netflix might have bought it okay but who can who can keep up yeah no it, it, it's impossible but i i remember 
I remember seeing it and feeling in the moment like, oh my God, like this is, this is nuts. And I'm, I'm a huge Army Hammer fan and I didn't really make any sort of moral judgment watching the documentary. It was just all insane and crazy to me. And then about a week later, I started, my point of view started to shift in terms of, I've had interactions in the past where, you know, a friend shows you one side of a text and then you don't see the other side of the text. And then you just start to form these opinions about the story without ever even talking to the other person that the story is about. And then I believe it was Megan Dom's podcast, mm. the, the unspeakable podcast yeah. that I came across that conversation and then the article as a result of that podcast. And there is so much that was not in the documentary and, and so much documentation, medical records, quotes other sides of messages like it it's almost like the people who made the documentary and were reporting on the story actively ignored all of the things that would have painted a much more uh much more fair accurate accurate yeah much much more accurate side to this how did you get involved with writing this this piece so i don't uh i've never really written about celebrities or Hollywood or anything like that. It's not my beat. Um, but I was approached by an intermediary asking me if I would, so someone who, who knows Hammer, and asking me if I'd be interested in interviewing him. Yeah. Because um, he had not spoken to the media at all since these allegations had been made. And I said yes, because I too, uh, when I read, or when I had heard about this, uh, these accusations, they seemed very, um, they were very salacious, they were very serious, um, but they also seemed a little um, out of this world. Yeah, I, I had a and, similar similar feeling. Um, and uh, as a journalist in general, I try to be skeptical. Um, yeah. Not of, you know, just, just to, to have an open mind and to understand that there are, you know, three sides to every story. There's one person's, the other person's, and then there's the truth, right? Yeah. So, um, and this just seemed like it was a very one-sided presentation. And um, it seemed like no one in the media, in the entertainment media who was covering this and writing about it was really doing their due diligence and was treating the claims made by some of these women with the skepticism that they deserved. And um, so I was interested as, as sort of a as, as someone who is in the media and watches the media and critiques the media because this is this is my business. It's how I make my living. Um, I was interested in it for that, not so much Army Hammer. I mean, I'm sort of, I'm sort of a fan. I've seen some of his movies. I think he's a he's a he's he's a fine actor. But again, I'm not really interested in the celebrity world. Mm. You know, I don't read TMZ. I don't keep up with what's going on. I don't really, I, I have a very inactive Instagram account, right? Like I'm yeah. not, it's not my um, world. I don't, I don't watch Entertainment Tonight or whatever it is that people who are obsessed with this yeah. stuff watch. It's not, um, I'm very not kind of hip to pop culture. And my, my partner makes fun of me a lot because I just don't know what's what's going on in the, yeah. in the pop culture. So I was interested in it as a media critique and as a sort of, um, um, a kind of object lesson in in how the media can rush to judgment. And, you know, a couple months ago, the LAPD, and in the end of May, the LAPD announced that they would not be pursuing its investigation anymore for lack of evidence against Army Hammer. How many people know that, right? I mean, lots of people know that he's a cannibal, supposedly, yeah. and that he violently raped a woman for five hours, and there's all these terrible things about him. But, you know, we do have a legal system in this country, and we do have a presumption of innocence, supposedly. Yeah. And um, I just think it's a it's a real shame that that people um, can be sub subjected to this kind of mob mentality. That I think was the other thing that that interested me in it because I do think since 2020 and and earlier, there's just been this mob mentality in our in our culture, cancel culture for lack of a better term, and rushes to judgment on all sorts of people, um, and a lot of overreach in our you know social justice movements, whether it's Me Too or the kind of post. George Floyd racial reckoning. There's 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 been a lot of 
I mean, obviously these are these are righteous causes, and they're and they're and they are addressing important issues in our society. Um, but they've there's in their zeal, you know, people have been um, treated poorly, and people have gotten um, uh, people have been unfairly. Uh, canceled or unfairly had their livelihoods impacted, and 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 that's this Army Hammer story seemed like it was part of that broader cultural phenomenon. Yeah, yeah. I so the the two main things that we're going to talk about during this conversation is the the Army Hammer piece, which is Army Hammer breaks his silence on airmail, mm-hmm. and the Secret City, the the hidden history of Gay Washington, and a through line in my mind through both of these while I'm reading them is, holy shit, where is the skepticism for both both pieces, even though they're, you know, they're, they're different uh, timelines, they're different periods of history. I could see why the skeptic brain would be interested in both of those stories, because there's a complete uh, just lack of saying, hey, you know, like, these are the claims, maybe these aren't accurate maybe this is not the entire story even if it is the entire story maybe we should at least do due diligence and look into the other side of it so i i can appreciate the way that you went through the army hammer piece um because of the the healthy skepticism throughout and i feel like that's something that society doesn't value really anymore like it, it, it like having a be, being a skeptic has a negative connotation when people normally talk about it like you're oh you're like you're skeptical of accusations yeah, do, like do your own research or that, yeah do your own research <laughs> yeah yeah like uh covid has a lot to do with yeah. that but even before that being a skeptic does not it 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 seems like it, it's it's not held in as high regard mm. as it as it needs to be when you're going through these accusations. Yeah, I do. I think especially past since the past couple of years, uh, really since tr- the rise of Trump, there's just been a lot of groupthink um, on both sides. Um, not as we don't pay as much attention to it on the left, I think, because it's very easy to see it on the right. Obviously, you know, people on the right just fell into line behind Donald Trump and stopped yeah. asking stopped asking questions and. You know, there are pe- conservative writers who uh, who were anti-Trump or conservative commentators. You know, they lost their contracts with Fox News, right? And they were kind of kicked out of the movement. And that's all uh, that's all very clear. And we're all very comfortable in sitting here in Brooklyn talking about that kind of groupthink. Yeah. But there's been a lot of groupthink on the left, and um, I've been in the middle of it, and I've fallen for some of it. I mean, for instance, you know, Russia Gate. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, this is just something that wide swaths of the country believe that Donald Trump was recruited by Vladimir Putin to run for president or he was recruited by the Soviets in the 1980s. And, you know, in those early months and really first year of the Trump presidency, I, I, I certainly, um, fell for a lot of that. And I was writing basically making those kinds of accusations and I should have known better. And a lot of us should have known better. Um, but there's just so much pressure to conform to um, popular opinion, or, or, or uh, not, yeah, popular opinion, or, or the prevailing opinion within your silo these days, um, and to not be skeptical and to not dissent from the party line, yeah. uh, to fall in, to fall into line, and um, I think it's just really important that as you know, citizens, we um, hear all sides and form our own opinions, and not let people do our thinking for us. Where do you feel like that pressure comes from when your opinions are being swayed to fall in line in a certain way that may not be accurate? Is it is it more is it more peer based thing where you're going to be around people who are of a certain political ideology and they're going to judge you for not having that? Is it the audience size or audience capture where you go in your mind? If I write that Donald Trump is essentially a video game character being controlled by Putin on a, you know, a controller Mm. back in Russia, that seems, like you said, salacious. It's it's like a, you know, Black Mirror episode. It's as soon as people see that I you read it, I've read it and it it feels 
uh, it feels uh, like the hooks dig into the reader. You're like, oh my God, like I need to know more. You go down the rabbit hole. D- do you think it's more the audience? Do you think it's more peer pressure or a combination of both? Well, we all have audiences now, don't we? Because of social media. Yeah. Right. We post things, even if you're not a, you know, if you're not a writer like myself with, with who's writing for public publications or you you're a you're a podcaster you have your own audience anyone has an audience you have a a facebook account you have an audience it's mostly people you know directly Uh, or if you have a twitter account you have an audience and so um i think for those of us who make a living off of uh expressing our opinions or creating content i hate that whole concept you know there's no such thing as writers or or artists anymore, or all just content creators. But if you do that for a living, then yes, audience capture is a real, um, a real uh, risk. And I think you see that it's very widespread. Um, yeah. And that, and this is really has to do with I think the collapse of traditional media over the past twenty five years, because it used to be that mainstream media, newspapers, and television uh, earned most of their uh, revenue from advertising. So like a, mm. news, a newspaper, you know, those full page ads you'd see for Neiman Marcus and department stores and also classified ads. And advertisers didn't care about the political views of the people who were buying their products. They just want you to buy their products, right? And, yeah. so, the, and so newspapers and television had an incentive to appeal to a broad audience of people yeah. across the political spectrum. What happens with the internet is that it destroys the advertising market, right? So Craigslist, you don't you don't see classified ads in newspapers anymore mm. because Craigslist and other other types of you know internet websites and whatnot destroyed that, um, and the internet in general just destroyed advertising. And so now most media outlets are subscriber based, right? It used to be that magazines and newspapers would not make much money actually from you, the reader, subscribing. Yeah. The money came from the advertisers who were buying pages mm. or buying airtime. And so now most media is funded through subscriptions, which means that if you're a particular newspaper or television station, you are more dependent. You're really dependent on your viewers, listeners, what have you, for your revenue, which mm-hmm. means you know you don't want to piss them off. You don't want to tell them things that they might not want to hear. Yeah. You want to give them what they want to hear so they'll continue subscribing to you. There are very few people who you know, will <laughs> pave openly for something that they don't like right or that they don't or 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 that's delivering news that might be uncomfortable or that or that might challenge their prejudices that's something that we need to do as citizens is to go out and find opinions that that challenge us and that we might disagree with and so you know i'm not going to name specific publications but you know certain newspapers that perhaps are the leading newspapers in the country um much read like they're more narrowly tailoring their mm. product for a certain type of person yeah because um, reading, subscribing to that publication is almost like an identity now, right? Like you are a, you subscribe to this newspaper, you're that kind of a person. Like it actually yeah. says something about your values and who you are, as opposed to just this is the outlet that I'm reading to get my fill of what's going on in the world today, right? Yeah. And so that's what a lot of publications are. It's what a lot of podcasts are. It's really what almost all media is today, is kind of audience driven and. It's a challenge. I mean, it, it means that um, if you're really trying to get, uh, you know, the full a full view of what's going on in the world, you have to read multiple pu- multiple publications and you and 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 um, listen to multiple voices because there's very few places that are going to ca- kind of give it to you straight, yeah, so to speak. Um, and as a and as a content creator, as a writer, as a journalist, absolutely, I think you you feel those pressures. Um, I really enjoy Substack. I mean, I think some of the best writing uh, now is on Substack, mm. but those writers are even more susceptible, I think, to audience capture because yeah. they are literally, their livelihood is being paid for by their readers, right? Like there's just, a, and there's no middleman. Like it's not like someone who writes for a newspaper. Yeah. And then you're paid a salary by the newspaper and the newspaper is publishing your views and, and, and then you know the newspaper is effectively the middleman between you, the writer, and the audience. The Substackers uh, are have a direct personal relationship with their with their readers. It's similar with podcasts, and look, there are great aspects to that. There are there are great things about that, but there's also, I think, a much 
higher risk of audience capture yeah. because you don't want to lose those subscribers. It, it can be very fun to hate watch or hate listen though. When I'm yeah. listening to podcasts to things that I don't agree with, there's a, there's a couple podcasts where I, I would say me and my girlfriend probably align on 70% of things. And then there's a few that she listens to where she puts it on the car and the whole drive, the podcast is, is, is playing. And then I'm like, stop it and then we argue for five minutes and then we play the podcast for another 10 minutes and argue for five minutes but it, it's actually very like, like i don't feel even though i said hate watching i don't feel hateful while i'm doing it but but i i, I would suspect that more people enjoy doing that sort of listening and, and consuming than maybe the major media outlets give them credit like that they're, they're i would guess that there's I, it's hard to put a percentage on it, but let's say 60% of people actively listen to podcasts or shows that they just don't agree with because you almost like get off on mm. like, fuck it. Like, but then you have to think about it and you absorb it and then things leak into oh, your yeah. mind. I mean, I think there are lots of liberals who watch Tucker, prefer yeah. Tucker Carlson for precisely that reason. There are less conservatives, I think, who watch Rachel Maddow. And we just know that because of the ratings. Yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> But yeah, that's I think that's a huge part of uh, media consumption, um, and it's just not it's not for me. I don't think either of those voices are uh, particularly helpful. Yeah. And off and offering, I think there's a lot. There's you know one of the be benefits of this new media environment is that there's a multiplicity of, of voices you can listen to, and I think there are smarter, more accurate, uh, more considerate conservative or I even say you know MAGA type yeah. sy MAGA sympathetic voices out there than Tucker who I really think is just a demagogue at this point and yeah. a liar um, it works <laughs> it does work unfortunately yeah. but I'd also say Rachel Maddow I think is also well, yeah. a demagogue as well she's not as dangerous so to speak because she's you know yeah. she's, not, she's not inflaming racial hatred in the way that you could say yeah. Tucker does um, Depending on your definition of work, it, it definitely gets the eyeballs for sure. Yeah, but yeah. I just think there are better progressive voices than her, yeah. and there are better right of center, you know, right wing voices than yeah. than him. But that's just me. So, in in terms of the Army Hammer interview, are you allowed to say what medium the conversation you had with him was over? Was it email or phone or in well, I person? Interviewed him. I interviewed him in person. Oh, it was in yeah, person. I think I mentioned that in the piece. Yeah, I, okay. I, I interviewed him in in, in Los Angeles. So. Okay. Yeah. What were your thoughts on him? Or, or you said you're not really the the pop culture. Mm. Uh, you weren't really following pop culture. Yeah. Did Did you have any preconceived thoughts on him going into that interview that were flip flopped or switched, or were you more going into it with an extremely uh, like unaffected mind in terms of the pop cultural story built up to him in that moment? Um. I had seen him in a few movies. I obviously seen him in in the Social Network, which I think is probably his, to this day probably still his most famous role. Where he played the Winklevoss twins. I had seen him in uh, Call Me by Your Name, which was a big independent movie. Um, that was great. The, yeah, the speech from the dad at the end. Yeah, it's one of my favorite scenes. Yeah, of it's all a great time. film. It's a great film, and and I think he was he was great in it. I mean, it's obviously it's more Timothy Chalamet's movie, mm. I think, but I thought he was he was great in it. I'm trying to think what else. I hadn't seen him in much else, to be honest. Um, he was in. He had a very small role in Nocturnal Animals, the Tom Ford movie. Yeah. So I wasn't, you know. Uh, by any means that familiar with his work as an actor. Um, he's he's extremely charismatic, I'll say. Mm. And I'd never spent some... I, I, I never... I, I should say, probably, I hadn't spent much time or gotten or interviewed someone of, of that stature as a celebrity before, yeah. really. I've dealt with a lot of politicians, yeah, of course, in my life. Um but with politicians, unless they're like, you know, Obama or Bill Clinton, they're not really that charismatic. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, gonna, they're, they're, they're really not. I was going to say, you uh, know, it, it, sometimes it seems like a, a fake charisma, too, where you can kind of yeah, see you can through see with through a lot it. of politicians. Yeah, yeah there's, a, there's a kind of... Um, it's not really present. It's like they're looking past you on TV. Yeah, it's or a something. smarminess. Yeah. And, whereas 
I was sort of unprepared for that kind of type of charisma. Right? Yeah. I mean, you know, Ar- Army Hammer is a movie star, or he was. We'll see what his future career holds, right? But he was a, he was a movie star, and he's obviously very handsome in a kind of traditional way. Um, and he, yeah, and he was just a very charismatic guy. And that's something, you know, as a journalist, I had to account for and not be uh, overly influenced by. Yeah. Um, because look, this is a guy who for a living pretends. Right? Yeah. That's, that's what actors do, is they pretend. So I had to be, again, I had to have my skepticism, right? I had to say, you know, interviewing this guy, it's like, yeah, he's really attractive. He's got a great winning personality. He's like a Labrador retriever. I mean, that's kind of mm. what actors are. So I had to be... Uh, aware of that going going into this and and not be sort of charmed yeah by by him um what is it like being in the moment around that type of energy because i don't know if i've ever been in a conversation with someone like army hammer or i hear a lot of people use the same uh type of ways describing tom cruise like in the moment he's just drops everything and you talk about this in the article too where he he remembers names yeah it's just like you can feel that he only cares about you and and there's like a extreme presence to it and and i i don't know if i've ever been around someone with that sort of celebrity stature that's also had that level of connection but i have to amend what i said in my last statement not a labrador retriever a golden retriever retriever. that's that's what you refer to a, a guy like that um it fits the hair color better yeah too. right yeah um no there was a real presence and i could t- i could understand why this why why he uh was such a successful actor you know yeah. i could i could you could you could and you could see and understand um why directors pretty u- universally enjoyed working with him i mean that was a, an, an, another aspect of the story um, was that there were no complaints about him from yeah. anyone in the industry. You know, I mean, there are plenty of people in that business, actors who are have reputations for being, you know, never mind uh, sleazy with women, but just also difficult to deal with and prima donna, and, yeah. you know, showing up late and not knowing their lines. And that, that, that happens a lot. And, you know, there's no stories like that about him. And yeah. Quite the opposite, in fact. I mean, um, the other thing that though that struck me by that story was just how without with the exception of the one producer of Call Me By Your Name, How Howard Rosenman, who I interviewed, was that no one, even to this day, now that he's been essentially legally exonerated, is no one who worked with him was willing to defend him publicly. Yeah. And you um, said that there was one other actor, Dakota Johnson, that came out, but she essentially reversed. Yeah, I her think she opinion. and she made a joke about him being yeah. a cannibal a couple of months ago, I think at the Telluride Film Festival yeah. or, or or one of them. So that to me was, I, it just was kind of a wake up call that, wow, Hollywood really is just a ruthless. Yeah. And people are, are spineless and just solely there to cover their own asses. I mean, I would like to think that if I were falsely accused of a litany of crimes, uh, that my colleagues and friends in the journalistic think tank community mm. in Washington, yeah. in New York, and the publishing world that I inhabit, I would like to think that they would. So, express some support or concern publicly, especially after I've been exonerated legally. Yeah, by the by the police, and that has not happened with him. And I think that's really telling. Yeah, I so and, I, I was curious uh, just to see what would come up because the exoneration was early June, so about was, a, like the a, end of the, May thirty first. I, th- I checked it yesterday. So at least a month and a half ago, mm. and I was searching on Google DuckDuckGo just bunch of search engines typing in army hammer lapd or army hammer case just to see if the main article that you wrote would come up or the 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 addendum with the exoneration and nothing came up four or five pages and nothing about army hammer um there there's something else that was uh, the entire first page. I think his wife just finalized the divorce. They Yes. That was everything. There's yeah. not a single story, at least in the first three or four pages, mm. about him being exonerated yeah. of the very charges that brought him into the spotlight. Yeah, I had a journalism professor who in college who would say that newspapers, when they issue corrections, 
instead of putting them on the corrections page, which is usually on like the second page of the newspaper in a small little box in the corner, sometimes it's even in a more obscure part of the newspaper, yeah. they should be forced to put the correction exactly where the story, the original story making the mistake was located, right? So yeah. if you make a mistake and an error in an A1 story, top right, you know, uh, section of the newspaper, which is the lead, where the lead story is, right? That's where the correction should go. It shouldn't yeah. go in the correction section. It should go where you made the mistake. And that doesn't happen, obviously. And um, yeah, I mean, that's just this, you know, it's this business. And, and uh, it's it's an unfortunate reality. Yeah. So the launching off point of this entire thing in terms of Army Hammer story coming into the spotlight, uh, seems to be the February 21st uh, incident where, a li oh no, it was uh, January 2021, mm -hmm. sorry, where uh, Efrosina Angelova, yeah. who goes by Effie, at House of Effie on Instagram, she posted screenshots of DMs from Army Hammer saying things like, you just to you just live to obey and be my slave. Uh, Army Hammer says, "I will own you. That's my soul, my brain, my spirit, my body. I am one hundred percent a cannibal. Uh, I will eat you," <laughs> which <laughs> doesn't look good, especially when they're only showing these texts in the the documentary. Uh, but it's it's sexual fantasies. It's like I it's even very... feel I even feel inappropriate talking about it now, right? Because yeah. it's. There, but for the grace of God, go I. Like, are we gonna are we gonna search through everyone's uh, sexts? Yeah. Or or pillow talk or I mean, these are intimate conversations between two consenting adults. Yeah. And uh, and you know, I, no one really has the right to pass judgment on those, unless if you're asexual and don't have sexual relationships yeah. with anybody. It just seems, and again, like there should have been from the beginning, anyone who's an adult and is engaged in sex with someone should have looked at this with more skepticism and understood from the beginning that these were, you know, out of context conversations. You yeah. were only seeing one person's side of them and they were intimate. Yeah. Yeah. The, and you're only, <laughs> you're only showing one side. Uh, I will say the other, uh, most of the text on that January, 2021 release, the, the, <laughs> It did strike me as a little bit funny where a lot of them like, uh, you know, I will eat you, live to a baby, my slave. They're kind of uh, dancing on the border of cannibalism. And then one of them says, I am 100 percent a cannibal. And I was like, why do you have to send that one? Like, just <laughs> just like let people uh, insinuate. Um, but obviously, yeah, like it's all sexual desires, it's sexual fantasies, intimate conversations between two people. Can can you tell the story of how things escalated from that January 2021 drop when Effie posted those screenshots to Instagram? How did things escalate from there? Um, you'd have to consult the story again because I was very meticulous yeah. in laying out the timeline. But if yeah. I recall, um, there were two other women who had... Uh, romantic sexual affairs with him who came forward with their own stories of alleged abuse. Grooming was one of the terms that one of the yeah. women used, which seemed like a strange term for a grown adult. Yeah, I think use. that that's was... A, that's uh, a word that's that's applied to pedophiles. So that, that seemed like... Not really sure what she meant by that. It may, it, it's just one of those words that's kind of like in the in the zeitgeist like like uh, gaslighting. Yeah. People don't really know what the meaning is anymore. They just have a vague sense of what it means and so they use it a lot and sometimes inappropriately. I think it was his wife that accused him of grooming. She did that not publicly. That, yeah. that came out in one of the and he was subjected to a a psycho uh, a psychological evaluation yeah. at at her direction because they were fighting over custody of their children. Um and she the now ex-wife alleged to the um uh to the psycho legal psycho legal report right so there's a team of psychologists she alleged that her ex-husband was grooming girls as young as 15 i believe yeah she also said that he was being investigated for murder and several other crimes and, and wanted to kill his and children. wanted to kill his own children that was right crazy. Yeah. yeah crazy yes absolutely 
Uh, so these other two women came forward with tales. Um, you know, one of them uh, saying that he had used a knife to uh, basically stab her and create a wound a half inch deep. Uh, there was there was a photo taken of this. He said it was what is called knife play, and that it yeah. was basically it was entirely consensual, and it was just leaving a tiny little scrape that led to some bleeding. But that was part of the, you know, sexual intensity of this act. It's not for me, but again, yeah, some people do this. There was a photo. I mean, there was all, a photo of it. A photo of it. Also, you know, a half inch deep wound would send you to the emergency room. Yeah. I mean, there's no. And she like, was saying it was double that. It was it was something, an inch deep. Something. Yes. Yeah. Again, I mean, these are just claims that are are facially absurd. Yeah. Right. And 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 anyone with any knowledge of measurements. <laughs> yeah. Should know should know that 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 these are absurd claims. Yeah, an inch um, deep. Like I've had paper cuts that have taken like an hour to stop bleeding right. because it was particularly bad. Or and so I'm mm. like. At taking an, a knife one inch deep on the blade and then not just inserting it in someone, but like dragging it to yeah. carve the a letter, letter. A, yeah. like immediately should set off yeah. alarms. And that was the most, I think, egregious claim that was made against him was this carving of his initial into this, yeah. into this woman's um, groin. Um, and then there was another woman who also made, you know, again, it was sort of... Uh, vague what she was saying she wasn't saying that she was raped she wasn't saying that that she was physically abused necessarily but that she'd engaged in sexual acts that she felt pressured into doing and later regretted um again consenting adults yeah. what are you exactly accusing him of here um you know you had a bad breakup yeah i'm sorry I think uh, one of the most interesting things that was left out, I, I forget if they mentioned the story of how Effie and Army met in the documentary going back all the way to 2016. I don't think they did because she refused to participate in, yeah, the, in the documentary. But what you uncovered with Effie messaging Army Hammer about donating to a charity with yeah. autism and even he has a relative who yeah. is autistic and then he's kind of like on the fence about it and then i forget what the exact text she sends but she says she told him she worked in a dungeon yeah a sex dungeon. sex dungeon yeah, so she really escalated it at the beginning and and then she that seemed to have just reeled him in with yeah. the whole like he was all, all, almost like fuck this like i don't need this and that like that that one text from her and obviously it goes into much more detail in the article but army hammer describes it as a, a beach ball effect where like that kind of unlocked this yeah. thing that he was trying to force down and yeah. suppress down and i guess it would be hard to prove if she knew that about him going in or, or did research about some of his sexual tendencies that he offhandedly mentioned in other interviews but that whatever her motivation was at that time that seemed to like unlock the uh the, the desire to experiment and enter the bdsm world consensually yeah 
and it yeah like and and that was all left out like the, the, no no meeting uh no uh like, like they it, it, there's this entire story of how they came together but the documentary and other sources just make it seem like you know maybe they messaged for a little bit back and forth he was in it 100 percent from the first text and even pursuing her and then he was the one who kind of dragged him in where it was the other way around it seems yeah like. yeah and the documentary seemed to spend most of its time on his family yes um which again is a relevance to whether or not he was a rapist or a cannibal or i mean which has no legal bearing um on his relationships with these individual women. And I think yeah. that was because they, um, look, he comes from a very wealthy family. Uh, he had a great grandfather who was a notorious sort of international rogue, Armand Hammer um, and whatnot. And um, so sells papers, right? I mean, yeah. and that's, and I think that they made up for a lack of um, any real kind of investigative. Um, acumen or um, really, and they they had no sort of new information that they could bring to light, and so they just kind of fell back on his uh, his family story and accusations that had been made about his great grandfather, his grandfather, his father. Um, it's not a it's not a quality journalistic product. I'll just yeah. I'll, I'll leave it at that. It, it was weird how they tried to tie it into the backstory of his. Uh... There you go. Tupac. Tupac? Yep. Shout out Tupac. Um there there was a it, it was very weird how they tried to tie in the dark aspect of his, you know, weird oil tycoon rich mm. uh you know, perverse family how they tried to paint this picture and then in your account and and all the documents he sent you and the conversation you had with him it it almost had nothing to do with the actual story like you said there was that one estranged aunt who was one of the feature aspects of the documentary but apparently hadn't really communicated with him much for the past 15 years and, yeah. but she was like i remember watching it and i'm like oh my god like she is the centerpiece of this she must really uh have her nails dug into like army's story and the the whole it, it definitely was to it, it's a good way to get people to watch a documentary like not just the the sexual perversion or just like the intimate happenings that they're trying to paint as non-consensual but like this isn't just an army hammer problem this goes back generations mm -hmm. and generations of like this rich family almost like a get out situation where they're like uh obviously like it, it, it's completely different plots but like that feeling of oh yeah like this is not just a modern day problem like th this family has been getting away for this for like 200 years yeah there's sort of generational uh, uh abuse of women yeah um and i think it kind of fit into this sort of trump era Right, they they were almost like the Trumps or something. Yeah, uh, it's just like toxic masculinity through the generations. It just yeah. seemed to be this kind of um, narrative that they were trying to push. Yeah. So, d do you think there was any collusion or planning between Elizabeth Chambers, Army Hammer's now ex-wife, and? Effie. Oh, we know. I mean, we we've seen the text messages. Now, I I didn't uncover those. Those were reported before by other media outlets showing. Really? I mean, it was actually I think it was Effie herself who released them. That's right. She got yeah. because she gets angry at everyone. I mean, her lawyer Gloria Allred dropped her as a client because she wouldn't sign an affidavit. That's probably yeah. one of the other reasons, by the way, why the LAPD yeah dropped its investigation because the main accuser was refusing to. Uh, Go on record. Claim her, you know, to state her claims under penalty of perjury. Um, so she ends up sort of turning on anyone and everyone. And that's what she did with Elizabeth. And she was publishing the um, messages that, you know, it was it was Elizabeth who sent her to Gloria Allred, who gave yeah. gave her the email of Gloria Allred. And again, these were things that, that had come out before my article. 
Um, but which didn't seem to really make a dent, I think, in the narrative until I published my piece, I think, because I was the first journalist to really just kind of take all the whole story thus far and, and put it together in one in one narrative. Um, yeah. Just, you know, there just hadn't, for whatever reason, um, no one, no, no journalist uh, did it. That's one of the other reasons why I, I think I wanted to do this story was because, um, you know, as a, as a writer, I try to do work that is original and um, that adds to the conversation. And I saw a big, um, a big um, story here that wasn't being reported. Yeah, I saw little pieces of of things that were that that could add up into a different alternative narrative to what we were all being told is the official story. The official story had been endlessly repeated, mm -hmm. but there was this whole other side, including from Army Hammer himself, his side of the story. But there were these other things, right? Like there was Elizabeth Chambers, you know, colluding with the main accuser. Uh, there was the fact that Gloria Allred dropped Effie as a client. That was something that was reported by another media outlet. I think it was yeah. Us Weekly reported it months before I did my story. That, to me, was one of the main uh, impetuses for me to pursue this. Because when I saw that, you know, Gloria Allred is not known for being publicity shy yeah. and for taking on, you know, taking on causes. Um, so the fact that she would drop, the, <laughs> the fact that she would drop someone. As a client, that was a signal to, to you the, that, that the credibility of, of yeah. Effie was in serious doubt, was in serious question. Mm. And again, it's like this is this was known for months. Why is no one writing about this? Why is no one following up on this woman's accusations? Why is this uh, uh, why is this ongoing investigation has been ongoing for almost two years, I, and someone's supposed to sit there in limbo with these with these accusations against them that they're a cannibal and a rape and, and a rapist, and they lose their all their livelihood and their trying to sell timeshares in the Cayman Islands and you know they're humiliated for doing that and the, he can't even he can't even do that it just seemed like there was this glaring um injustice i mean yeah and it's an injustice yes army hammer is a handsome white guy who is a movie star but you know what they can be uh they can be victims too yeah uh and it seemed like he he was um the victim of a of a of of an injustice here and that there was a uh, a narrative that had been spun about this story that was largely false. Yeah, the the text between Elizabeth Chambers and Effie, the main accuser, were like like and knowing that those texts were out there before you published this article, it's mm. it's just so shockingly blatant that people chose to ignore it. Like she she literally. Um, on, on February 21st, Elizabeth Chambers uh, issued a statement saying she was, quote, shocked, heartbroken and devastated by the allegations. And she will listen and learn. And I didn't know how much I didn't know. And then there's like text behind the scenes with her and Effie saying, I really need custody of my precious children. Do you think you could make a declaration this week? It will all be private which right, and this was months before months before yeah. yeah um and to me just anyone reading that article and by the way like the the article that you wrote people definitely have to go check it out it's presenting the facts there's not yeah. much uh, opinionated yeah. spin to it it's literally just laying out the story and the timeline that it occurred and without the opinion inserted in my head i'm going oh this sounds like a custody battle that just got out of control or there's like one little spark that Elizabeth Chambers maybe got in the back of her mind like oh maybe I could use this to win custody maybe I don't know and it it sounds like it just snowballed and snowballed and snowballed to the point where they couldn't go back on anything that they said Effie or Elizabeth Chambers and it just at that point you have to you can't say you're a liar i mean you could but like it's just it, it seems like a, a small situation that absolutely exploded out of control and the the custody battle based on what you presented seems to be a big impetus of that yeah like you know i i i come from an opinion journalism background that's really most of my work or a large a large portion of my work does fall into that but um with this i didn't really want to weigh in 
so much. It was a very complicated story. There were lots of pieces that needed to be explained, and I just figured it would be more effective piece of journalism uh, just to lay it out there and let readers decide for themselves. Because I think yeah. that that's a problem with a lot of journalism today is that there's a lot of reporters and writers who um, are supposed to just cover the news, but who often feel the need to give their slant. Yeah. Um, and that's that's a problem. I yeah. Think. Yeah. No, it was not needed at all. In no, this it was more effective that way. Yeah. Because it, it's it, it's planting the seed and you can connect the dots as a as a reader and <clears throat> see how everything comes together and also just the the, the things that were blat- blatantly left out of the main media arc the the me too nft sounded like <laughs> something like i literally was like this is a south park episode yeah. there, there would be a south park episode about uh someone who falsely uh claims to have been sexually abused and then releases an nft i who never met him by the way who never met him that's the the it's crucial the bit of craziest here. part that that was um i forget if that was page or julia courtney Sam. julia morrison yeah, yeah. for people who um haven't read the piece yet julia morrison never met army hammer was in communication with him on instagram New York Post and uh, other outlets referred to him, referred to her as an ex yeah. of was, Army Hammer. New York Magazine, I think. Yeah. yeah, even though they had never actually met in person. Yeah. And then she turns around and takes a screenshot of the partial conversation that yeah. they had. Just his. Just his end of it. Yeah. And then registers it as an NFT. And I thought the most hilarious part was she said a portion of of the donations would go to, <laughs> mm. uh, you know, some me to charity, charity or yeah, yeah, some women's charity. So like it wasn't even, and a portion could be 2%, yeah, but like, right. I, I wonder like who, who is around these people, especially the accusers that are enforcing these ideas and, and enforcing like, oh yeah, like that's the right move. Like she's talking to her friends or, or Elizabeth Chambers talking to her friends and, uh, they're just like, oh yeah, go for it, totally. Like this I is- actually blame the journalists because we we have a journalistic culture now, where so many of these outlets will just print any allegation. If you can just stick the word alleged in there, they'll print it. Yeah, and this happens all the time, and they just duplicate each other. And there's just so many of these websites now that have so low standards, and they don't do any original reporting. Um, and it's really frightening. Because anyone is uh, susceptible to being accused in this fashion. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, there are just journalists who are not exercising discretion. And this is this this drive for clicks, I think, is mm. a huge part of it. Um, and I think that's what we saw in this case. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, also putting the question mark at the end of article titles. Yeah. I, I don't know how you Army feel about Hammer, that. Cannibal. Can, yeah, exactly. You anything literally like <laughs> I, ice cream, ice cream. That that's just uh, Tupac's soul yeah, trying to get I'm on the sorry, podcast. Yeah, he's really, no, no, he's he's uh, he's really trying to make an effort to become part of this conversation. <laughs> um, for people that are just listening, uh, James is using a Tupac coaster and he keeps trying to rise the glass back to this stuck. world. Yeah. Yes, exactly. That's exactly. I've had to pulled away but the, yeah the, like the question mark at the end of article is where you could say ice cream truck driver poisons fifth grader mm. and put a mm. question mark at the end of it yeah. and then you go into the actual article and it says there's actually no evidence that <laughs> this happened he most likely ate the ice cream and got a mm. stomach ache yeah. from something completely different but it, like it, it's crazy how you can't get uh well i mean i'm sure you could get sued if someone decided to sue you for the question mark but does that give you immunity from being sued if you just add a question mark to any title well this is a whole nother conversation about defamation law and whatnot and it has to do really with the whether the person uh is considered a public figure yeah um because then the standards are much the 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 threshold for de- defamation is much higher when you're dealing with the with a public figure um there's a case new york times versus sullivan from the 1960s i believe that is sort of the the legal standard on this and it, uh, it 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 established that in terms of public figures there has to be a very high bar uh for defamation so that's why 
you know, you see Donald Trump when he's like threatening to sue the media, to sue newspapers. It's mostly idle threats because he's the president. He's probably the most famous person in the world, right? So it's extremely difficult. But when you're dealing with people who are essentially private citizens, uh, or if you look at this, you know, defamation case involving Dominion voting systems, right? Mm. I mean, and they 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 would have won, uh, which is why Fox settled because they were afraid that if they took that case to trial, I mean, aside from the discovery process and what would have come out, I think they also realized that they could have lost even more money than what they settled for. Yeah. Um, but that's um, but yeah, if you're just a if you're just a private citizen, then uh, you have a it's much easier to file defamation cases against um against the media were you were you worried at all that one of the victims or you know one of the uh, alleged victims accusers, would come after you? accusers yeah uh would come after you for what you wrote oh i'm sure i knew that they would i certainly knew effie would and she did she she posted my you know uh exchanges with her i tried to reach out to her on multiple social media platforms to get her to talk which is what i have to do yeah. As a journalist, is to is to reach out for comment. That's that's kind of the one oh journalism one oh one, and I and I made efforts to do so with her, and she didn't respond. And then immediately after the story came out, she she posted those messages. I'm not really sure what purpose she was trying to serve by doing that. Yeah, um, like look, a, here's a journalist doing his he's doing job. his job, <laughs> right, right. But um, I mean, look, we had lawyers. You know, airmail has no. lawyers like every publication, and they went over that story multiple times with a fine tooth comb, and and it was probably one of the most heavily scrutinized uh, stories I've ever done in my life as a journalist, just in terms of the amount of fact checking and editorial consultation with my colleagues at airmail and law and legal input and whatnot. So yeah, I mean, we 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 stand by our story. Yeah, and there have been no, you know, there have been no serious claims against any of the any of the facts reported in it so how much effort goes into a 30 minute write-up like that just like the amount of time uh with all of the the traveling the writing the fact checking mm. um going through drafts and drafts and drafts and and, and shortening it down because you know I, i'm not a, a journalist there are a lot of people listening to this that probably don't have a, a good conception of time of how long it really takes to put together a piece like that mm. could you put a number of hours or, or just like a rough estimate of how long the story actually took Ugh. to come together um i mean i began it i i interviewed him at the end of october it was published i think the first weekend of february i was doing other things in the interim it's not like i was you know it's not like it I'm going to say it took me three whole months to do it, but I would say, yeah. you know, it took, I would say if, if I had cumulatively added up every day here, a week there, I mean, you know, probably a month to five, six weeks, maybe. It was a lot yeah. of effort when, when, when into that piece. So. Yeah. There was, uh, I, while all this was going on, or I mean, it, it's been actively going on since January 2021. But I had a conversation with a luxury dominatrix in New York City. Her name is Mistress Natalie. And that actually really changed my perspective, not just particularly on this case, but the the BDSM community in general. Because, you know, like a lot of people, I saw this story and, you know, immediately started to draw conclusions about kink or the different aspects that go into BDSM scenes and, and consent and things like that. And as I was reading this article, I was thinking back to the conversation that I had with Mistress Natalie about all of the meticulous planning that mm. goes into something yes. like the, I think it was the non- consensual consent yeah. or and and i, I forget uh, consensual non consensual non-consent right where you pretend that this is a non-consensual encounter yeah but you've established beforehand that it's role play right so you you're you're acting like it's a rape but you're acting the, exactly right that the, the non-consent is consensual and army hammer and effie i believe had one of these mm -hmm. scenes mm -hmm. and I'm. I was thinking back to th this this conversation about BDSM that I had, and just like the the 
the BDSM community, which I still don't know a lot about. I've, I've just did research for that conversation, talked to her for a few hours. Like it's still something that I love to learn more about, but like the amount of trust and, and rules and boundaries and all of the things that go into planning something like that to make sure that you're experiencing pleasure on both sides. And that's something that Army talks about in the article is that he obviously like you want to give pleasure yeah. like that's well there are people who don't they're they're called rapists right that, there, that, there are people yeah. who derive sexual pleasure from rape yeah uh those people need to be you know locked up uh that's not i mean that's not what army hammer is yeah it, right? it, i mean he's he, at least according to him and according to the lapd he's not a rapist yeah it, it, but it like if i didn't have that conversation there would be a lot like for whatever reason we, we've become you know obviously a, a much more open society with accepting people's sexualities and you know whatever you do behind closed doors is your thing uh as long as it's not causing harm to other people but for some reason kink and bdsm in particular there's still like this uh St tinge stigma of yeah or... stigma of like there's something wrong with it. Like it, it makes you seem perverse mm. in the public eye because you would engage in BDSM. And I was holding some of those preconceptions and I'm talking to um, Mistress Natalie who, you know, so eloquently, uh, it wasn't even a, that much of a sexual conversation. It was more like just explaining what goes on in the BDSM world and how to engage in something like that. And, what it means to be in a in a scene and what it means to have that sort of agreement and based on the the, the conversation with army hammer that was published he, he does seem to care a lot about that connection that trust that you know mutual pleasure um like this is something that's supposed to be fulfilling versus what was painted in the media which is you know this is like a very one-sided attack on another sexual partner uh yeah and that's how certainly how he described it and um again these two other women who had sexual relationships with him they gave a different story uh where they said they felt coerced um at that point it really becomes a kind of he said she said right but if they're not accusing him of rape if they're not accusing him of violence neither of them were um i don't really see what role we have as outside uh observers you know where how, how, how we're supposed to react to that i mean what are we supposed to do in that sort of situation and i should add you know he admitted that he was emotionally abusive yeah he was very upfront about that in our interview and he was careful to distinguish uh emotional abuse from physical abuse um there's no crime against emotional abuse <laughs> uh, mm. i'm sure most of us in our lives have been the victims of it and many of us have perpetrated it yeah it's something that a lot of us do and in, in our and have have done and have had done to us um but it's not illegal and it's not the role of our judicial system to um determine victims and perpetrators in cases of emotional abuse. I mean, yeah. the justice system is already overburdened as it is. I can't imagine what the docket would look like if it was yeah. over, if there was their responsibility to, you know, adjudicate alleged emotional abuse. Yeah. Come on. A anyone who's ever had a, a flimsy college hookup would be yeah. accused and, you sure. know, indicted right. for ghosting. <laughs> right. Right. Which, you know, I, I've, I've done and I'm not proud of it, but that no. would certainly fall under yeah. a, a type of emotional yeah. abuse where you're, you're just, you're communicating with someone, even if it's not physical, you're, you're just, you're manipulating someone's emotions in a way to give yourself the benefit and then kind of just discard them yeah. and, and don't think about it. Yeah. And he said he did that, you know, with, yeah. with Courtney and page right that he he was a movie star and a celebrity and these were younger women they were in the case of page I and mean, significantly younger i think she was 20 or 21 and he was 34 at the time what right not and so he was yeah was he using his celebrity and his his status to to um 
lead these women on and sort of take them on this whirlwind romance for a couple of months and then move on to the next yeah. girl. It's not great behavior. And, you know, he, he has atoned for it or he's trying to atone for it and he's admitting it. Um, but it's not a crime, nor should it be yeah. a crime. Yeah, he uh, he admitted to the emotional abuse and he's also going through at least it's it, it seems like he's going through a, a just a shit show whirlwind of emotions and figuring out who he is tying back all the way to the the childhood trauma mm. that that episode that he speaks about getting sexually abused by someone in the church i forget yeah, if it was, it was a, a, youth, a, pre, a, a youth, youth pastor, pastor yeah. but like to be actively digging through childhood trauma like that where you get abused you're in an ending marriage and then all of a sudden you discover this whole side of yourself that is into BDSM and power dynamics and bondage, things like that in the bedroom, like just separately, those are enough to cause anyone to go off the rails and to have all three of those come together at the same time and be a celebrity. That's mm. like the fourth thing. Yeah. Like, I don't know if I would have even been able to handle that in my own private life, but the, the he, he was tackling all of that and um, obviously was faced with a huge uh, media misportrayal of what was actually going on. But just like from his side, I, it just made me think about um, how tough that would have been emotionally to sort of figure yourself out in the moment while all this shit is happening it's all happening in the public eye you know is this is this childhood trauma is this a, like is this part of my sexuality is it both like and i'm entering this whole world with rules and um different power dynamics and i'm trying to like make this it, like it's all new to him yeah it seems like a very tough situation to be in without a celebrity profile and then he you know is doing this all in the public eye yeah no i think um he was not in an enviable position yeah um i'm, I'm just gonna go to the bathroom real quick yeah sure I'll... we'll take a break oh, yep okay so so prior to writing the article on army hammer you spent almost a decade on and off researching mm. and writing secret city the hidden history of gay washington what in, what inspired you to go on that decade long endeavor to put together you know ultimately eight hundred pages? Uh, well, I've always been interested in the Cold War, um, really dating back to high school, and particularly in college where I uh, studied with a professor, John Lewis Gaddis, who's really the dean of of Cold War studies, Cold War history, um, and. I'm a gay man, and I understood that th that there was this this issue, this big issue in American politics, um, really across the whole history of of the Cold War during that that sweep of time, when to be gay was really the most dangerous thing you could possibly be in mm. Washington. Um, the, the fear that you, know, you could be blackmailed, that you represented a national security threat. And it just impacted so many events and phenomena, um, individuals, um, so many aspects of American politics and public policy during that time that it just yeah. seemed like a really rich topic. And uh, when I was a student at Yale also, I had the opportunity to get to know a man named Larry Kramer, who was a, a very um, important, famous uh, AIDS activist, gay novelist, writer, playwright. Um, I got to know him, and, and he was also very interested in gay history and gay people in history. And um, uh, he really kind of personally inspired me to sort of undertake this as a as a as a project. Yeah, um, yeah. W one of the most uh, fascinating through lines of the book, and you mentioned the the danger of being gay. Th the the switch from homosexuality pre-world war ii from being a mental illness mm. and a, a sickness in the yeah. public eye and then world war ii comes around and all of a sudden you're a threat to national security yeah. like you go from being sick to dangerous yeah. so like 
gays cannot uh, could not catch a break <laughs> throughout history. Yeah, there's up actually until that point a, a formative event in that transformation just took place not far from here uh, in Brooklyn on three twenty nine Pacific Street, uh, which was a male brothel, mm. and it was near the Navy Yard, which at the time was where a lot of ships were coming in and out, and um, allegedly. A United States Senator, David Walsh, who was a Democrat from Massachusetts and the chairman of the Naval Committee, he was allegedly spotted at this male brothel where it was also alleged uh, a number of Nazi spies were also hanging yeah. out. And so this kind of became the first real public gay scandal in American politics. It was the first outing mm. in American politics. And it was really due to, it happened in May 1942. So it's you know, five months after Pearl Harbor. So right mm -hmm. in the beginning, early months of the war. And so that had a huge impact on um, the perception of homosexuality in America and also the perception of homosexuals uh, that they could be easily blackmailed yeah. um, because they had this, again, secret, as you say, which which was considered a mental illness and a sin and, a, and was, a, was a crime in every state in the country. Uh, and so that really, yeah, World War II played a, played a huge role in, um, you could say, securitizing uh, homosexuality as, yeah. a, as, a, as a threat. I, I was trying to wrap my head around what would make someone uh, think that being gay would be a national security threat. And, and the reason that you point to in the book is you're, as a gay man, during that time, back in the 1940s, the book goes all the way through 1995, I yeah. believe. You are keeping a secret. You're living a double life. You you're more likely to be blackmailed and give up uh, very classified information right. to a foreign power. But you could also make the opposite argument that because you are gay you are more practiced in living a double life in, de in deception and you could be a better spy you're, yeah. you're you're you know you're keeping a secret for your own safety every single day and right. keeping your job so you're used to just walking out of the door essentially you know zipping up the the heterosexual mm. suit and going out into the world which is exactly what a spy needs yep. to do you basically need to wear an identity as soon as you walk out the door or even when you're in your own home if, if, if anyone's bugging you yeah. or filming you or things like that so like i i i couldn't get away from that like what why the the perception swung in the negative direction instead of trying to i mean th this sounds like a bad thing to do but like leverage homosexuality yeah. for yeah. the good of the national security and and also um there I, I I was thinking about something else too, but it just slipped my mind. But yeah, like uh, the, the uh, why the w what made the pendulum swing to the negative direction rather than using people, uh, gay people, to essentially like use the skills they they have to do every day to be you know skilled in espionage. Well, there was sort of a paradoxical nature to it, and even the the director of the CIA in the early in the sorry in the late nineteen forties when the or it's in nineteen fifty actually when the lavender scare began to heat up, he testified before Congress and said that um, there's actually a situation right now where a homosexual might be useful in penetrating a certain Soviet... Good uh, choice of words. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, it might be useful for our operations um, in, in, in the Soviet Union, right? He wouldn't give any more details. So they, they understood that there was this use that, that gay people could play. Um, and in fact, I also uncovered... Uh, a proposal that was sent to the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, which was the predecessor to the CIA, where it was being suggested to them by a, a researcher, a sexual researcher, someone who kind of researched uh, sexual deviance, which is as gay people were called, where he actually suggested using gay men as spies mm. for precisely this yeah. reason. And also because there was this conception at the time that the Nazis were disproportionately gay. Yeah. Um, and so there was this belief that if we insert a couple of, you know, handsome young men into the Nazi uh, high command, we'll be able to then, you know, uh, infiltrate them and then and then extract um, useful information. So that that was a proposal that was on the desk of the OSS. They never pursued it. I couldn't find any evidence that they pursued it. Uh, but there were a number of gay spies in the OSS whom I write about um, in the book. And at that time, you know, the OSS was a more sort of liberal environment. 
Um, it was run by a guy named William Donovan, uh, Wild Wild Bill Donovan, who was this sort of great American character yeah. who, who recruited all sorts of people, academics, and he said that the best OSS officer was a PhD who could win a bar fight. Um, <laughs> you know, so it's this very kind of dashing, swashbuckling yeah. guy, and you know, and there were there were communists in the OSS, there were leftists, there mm -hmm. were all these sorts of people who would never survive in Washington after. World War II when the Cold War began, right? And that, that's actually, that has a lot to do with the the rivalry that existed and existed for a long time between the FBI and the CIA that you could argue even culminated in 9-11 in because there was such poor um, intelligence sharing between those two agencies. A lot of it had to do with these rival cultures and 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 you could even boil it down to a, to a different view on homosexuality and that the FBI was really a much more conservative institution was concerned with rooting out alleged or you know uh, security risks in the federal government, and they saw homosexuals as a, as a real threat in that regard. Whereas the CIA, which was born out of the OSS, had a much more liberal, open-minded, broad-minded um, view on human intelligence. Was willing was willing to have people who might have sort of unorthodox backgrounds, political mm. political beliefs. I mean, in the early years of the CIA was a was a liberal, it was liberals who ran the CIA in its early years. Um, they were supporting, you know, socialist parties and labor unions mm. in Europe because they saw those, the anti-communist left as being a very important bulwark against the communist encroachment. They were supporting literary magazines, uh, actually quite great literary magazines, Encounter Magazine, uh, they were supporting ex uh, ex um, expressionist art exhibitions, right? They were doing all these kinds of interesting cultural uh, things, and that kind of environment was more open to having people who were maybe, you know, sexually non-conformist non yeah. than the FBI was. And so there was this real rival, a, a, a large part of the rivalry between the FBI and the CIA that would go on for decades. Um, you you could see in their kind of differing attitudes towards this question. So did the FBI's view of homosexuality win out because the yes. CIA was so new? Like, well, yeah, well, the CIA was new, and it was, um, um, you know, J. Edgar Hoover was just a you know he had been he had been around for twenty five yeah. years by that point of the early years of the Cold War. Um, the CIA was also you know we were seen as uh, and we did we had we had these big defeats overseas. In the early years of the Cold War, we lost China, yeah, right to the communists, and Stalin was encroaching, and those were seen to large degrees as you know foreign intelligence failures, and there were failures of the CIA, um, and there was a Red Scare, a domestic Red Scare in mm. the United States that the FBI played a huge part in fomenting and um, enforcing, um, and so yeah, absolutely, uh, and uh, you had a couple of high profile spies. Alger Hiss, the Rosenbergs, um, and so people looked up to J. Edgar Hoover as being, you know, this real, uh, you know, the expression of, of Americanism, and yeah, the yeah. FBI was, and so yeah, the CIA by night, by the early 1950s is uh, basically expelled, and there's one figure I saw from the CIA itself that 25% that of all the people who were fired or lost their jobs during those early years of the Red Scare at the CIA were uh, were fired or, or were denied a job on, on the basis of homosexuality. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's funny how it goes back to the skepticism through line. That mm. if, if someone presents you with the case that being homosexual makes you more of a liability to national security because you're holding a secret, you have that other side of it what, that is well if you can hold the secret and you do it well it's going to make you more of an asset and at the same time i'm just imagining you know if i was a 25 year old heterosexual cia spy back in you know 1945 and i'm being approached by some hot as shit russian <laughs> undercover agent and i have no idea she's undercover maybe at that point i don't even care like yeah you know things are getting hot and heavy and she's just like i'm a spy and i'm just like i don't care let's you know let's let's do this i i don't see how being heterosexual doesn't also make you a liability for those very same reasons it might actually make you more of a liability being a heterosexual because you have more to lose. I'm not keeping a secret yeah. also. Like yeah. I'm not practiced in living a double life. Whereas people who are gay during that time 
were living a double life. Yeah, and the solution to that problem would have been for the CIA or the State Department or any other government agency to basically tell its employees, if you're homosexual, tell us. And yeah. then, and then, then the potential blackmailers have no power over you, right? Because yeah. if the supposed power is the secret that you're homosexual, uh, if you tell us, and we know this, then there's no leverage yeah. over you. But that wasn't uh, that didn't win out. That argument did not win out. There's because there was also a strong moral argument to understand at the time. Was it wasn't just that gays were seen as being potential blackmail targets. It was also there was a revulsion towards gay people, right? That they were sick that they were mentally ill, they were all these things. So that even if a homosexual was open about being gay, it was no defense um, because they were they, they represented evil. Yeah. I mean they they were they were sinners, they were criminals and they were they were insane. Considered it, considered mentally ill. There was a guy, Alsop, was it? Joe he, Alsop, Joe was Alsop. a journalist, very famous journalist at the time, yeah. And he was who, who was a test case, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, he was a closeted gay, very influential journalist, one of the most influential journalists in, in, in America in the 1950s and earlier and, and into the 60s and early 70s even. Yeah, who was set up in a classic KGB honeypot situation in Moscow in 1957. They lured him with a young, handsome man, set up cameras in the hotel room took photographs knocked on the door the next you know immediately after they had finished having sex threw the photos down and basically told him we want you to you know basically be an informant for us in washington and he um he later wrote about it uh but in in a statement that he wrote to the cia explaining everything that happened right so he did exactly he he, he told the soviets basically to go fuck themselves mm. uh and got the first flight out of moscow um, and then, but he confessed everything to the CIA. So he did exactly what a gay person in such a situation would be expected to do at the time by the rules of the national security state, right? He resisted the Soviet blackmail attempt and he explained everything. He went through the whole, he actually provided a service to the CIA because he told them all the trade craft, right? This is how, this is what the Russians did. They got me drunk. They sat a handsome young man next to me at dinner. We started talking about yeah. so-and-so. He brought me to his hotel room. There, he described. I mean, he was a great writer, so you can actually read. You know, yeah, it was the, a full. Like, he nine wrote a nine-page, yeah. you know, and he went into his whole history. And I mean, and he was a great writer, and he he, he described the whole uh, scenario, um, but it had no impact on government policy. You and know, he, they didn't, he was they didn't, ultimately fired. No, right he actually, for... interestingly, he he maintained his job in Washington, okay. um, which was interesting because everyone knew. Obviously, the Eisenhower administration at the time knew, um, and the Soviets knew. And he continued in his in his journalistic work, um, and he was very courageous about it because he was a very strong critic of the Eisenhower administration for being too weak on the Soviets. He was a big supporter of John F. Kennedy, um, and he knew all along that the that the CIA and the FBI had this information about him, yeah. and yet he didn't desist in criticizing the FBI. Or oh, sorry, in the he didn't desist his criticisms of the Eisenhower administration. He likewise was a was an extreme hawk on the Cold War, and was you know very anti-Soviet. Um, and all along, he knew that either the Soviets or anyone in Washington could expose him as gay, and he and he didn't desist in his in his. In his writing, in fact, he was one of the strongest, you know, advocates of American intervention in Vietnam. And then sometime in the early 1970s, somebody sent photogra these photographs, these, you know, by, by that point, 15-year-old photographs, someone sent them in anonymously in these manila envelopes around Washington mm. to his worst enemies. Um, and it's interesting, no one who received the photographs did anything with them. That would never happen Which would today. never happen today. <laughs> no I mean, You can imagine if, you know, if if... If some liberal received photographs of Tucker Carlson in, uh, you know, compromising sexual positions, I can guarantee you they'd be on the internet within seconds. Oh yeah. Um, well, at least you have the deep fake defense. That's today. true. As, I didn't as, have that sixty years ago. That that's that's going to be crazy as as deep fakes and AI renderings for photos and videos get better and better. Yeah. Will those sort of leaks? even be meaningful mm. anymore if you catch someone in the act or whether it's cheating or doing something illegal and you have a photo could you 
just say, yeah, but it wasn't me as a deep fake. And we'll get to the point where it just becomes so common that people won't question it as a society. Yeah. That'll be interesting. Yeah, that's something I really uh, don't look forward to. <laughs> and so even being able to create someone's voice. Yeah. I've seen a lot of the mm -hmm. the music renderings with you know Drake or uh, Elton John rapping a Drake song wow. and then podcasts with you know Joe Rogan and Steve Jobs and just like it's an hour and a half of what sounds like a very uh choppy you mm -hmm. can definitely tell it's probably mm -hmm. like 70% of the way there give it time it's uh, it, it's going at the speed of light and it's going it's going to be a, a you know fascinating uh potentially very dark world to live in from that standpoint. Yeah, we're going to be living in a Black Mirror episode. Yeah. And what will even happen to uh, credibility as a, as a journalist? If someone can recreate mm. your voice to the point where you can type in James Kerchick into ChatGPT and say, write me as a, an article on the Capitol riots and the voice of James Kerchick and it, it's really good and you know maybe it's almost indistinguishable um i'm out of a job at that point Fuck. yeah what <laughs> this is a, a a complete tangent and we'll, we'll get back to um the secret city but it, it just popped into my head with the whole writer's strike that's going on in yeah. hollywood right now and with artificial intelligence being a, a a big thing that hollywood is just not willing to step back on and that's a, a main uh gathering point of the writers is that we want you to commit to not using ai to yeah. a certain extent what what do you think on that whole i fully support, i fully support them in this i think it's uh very grave what the studios are trying to do and inappropriate um and even immoral if i may say yeah and i think uh all of us i'm not a member of the writers guild i hope maybe to one day be if i if i ever write for, for television or film uh, but we all should support them in this because I think they're standing not up. They're standing up not only for writers in general, but um, for all of us who express ourselves as human beings. Uh, that um, we should be able to protect our our rights and our and our creative work. Do you think there's a way that AI can enhance human writing without replacing it and eventually taking over, or do you think once it becomes a mainstream thing to replace writers with AI in certain fields that it's it's just, you can't stop it. Hmm. No, I haven't really experimented with it because I'm, I'm probably scared. Um, I, I would like to think that there are ways for it to maybe, if I type in a sentence that maybe has poor structure or maybe I'm using the incorrect word, um, that I would, I would like to think that, hey, maybe, the AI, maybe this AI can make my sentence sound better. Yeah. Um, but then I worry that that's a slippery slope. I worry that that might lead to plagiarism, or that yeah. But at which point are you, you know where does the individual creativity end and where does the um, the machine begin? Like, yeah. Right. Where does where who's who can claim credit for the work at that point? I think that's a real serious moral quandary that yeah. we, that we may be facing. I will say that. At least with ChatGPT, creatively it seems pretty terrible. <laughs> For things like, if if you typed a prompt into ChatGPT, like write me up a legal contract to sell my apartment in Brooklyn, and then I just plug in my credentials and hand it off. It, it's pretty good at like technical things like that, or, or even coding. I'm not well versed in coding, but I know a lot of people use it for code. But in terms of writing a stand-up set in the voice of Dave Chappelle or, um, you know, a, a screenplay in the voice of, you know, X writer. It's, it's very, from the examples that I've seen are pretty bad and they're only entertaining because of how bad they are at the moment. Like I, I've, I've gone down the rabbit hole of stand-up and, and just cause I'm a huge stand-up comedy fan of what AI is capable in that sense. And, it's funny because it's bad. It's not yeah. nearly to the level of replacing creatives, at least. Well, that's reassuring. That's reassuring, yeah. but I don't, I don't know how much longer that's going to be the case. Yeah. You're actually talking to the chat GPT version of me right now. That's, that's <laughs> not, uh, um, <laughs> hopefully, uh, 
that never happens. But um, in in terms of becoming a writer in the Screen Actors Guild, I feel like there are many parts of the Secret City that could be turned into a movie or a series. There, a lot of like one of the things uh, that could definitely be a uh, some sort of like Netflix miniseries is is the whole outing of Reagan. Like that the, whole thing, the attempt to out the attempt. The He's att- not. He was not gay, Ronald Reagan. Yeah, there, there was an attempt to maybe claim that he was. <laughs> the attempt to um, out Reagan. Can you tell the the story of that whole alleged uh, Reagan homosexual mm, cabal, yeah. like that whole situation? Yeah. So when Reagan was governor early in his term of California, there was actually a, a small gay. Well, not small. There was a gay scandal. Uh, where he was accused of having uh, a number of gay staffers who had participated supposedly in an orgy at a timeshare house in Lake Tahoe. Um, And one of the men accused of doing this, not by name, it was was sort of inferred in a newspaper column, was Jack Kemp, who at the time Mm. was a football player, a professional football player, who would later become a congressman and then ran for vice president with... Robert Dole in 1996, and this was, uh, so there was this this alleged homosexual ring in the governor's office in 1967, and Reagan fired two men um, who had been supposedly a part of this ring, and it would come back to bite him in the summer of 1980 when he was the, about to be nominated by the Republican Party um, to be their presidential candidate, and there was a group of um, moderate and liberal Republican congressmen who put together a dossier in which um, a number of men alleged that they had been sort of sexually approached by, oh, actually it was one man. Well, well, there was a, it's it's complicated. There, it was a complicated yeah. story. There was one man who alleged he had, he had been sexually approached by two different Reagan aides. There was a separate encounter involving a congressman named Bob Livingston uh, where he had uh, what he thought, what he believed was a sort of a, uh, he, had, he had a drunken dinner with a with a Republican lobbyist who mm. made a move on him, and all these sorts of events led this group of uh, Republican congressmen to try to to basically torpedo Ronald Reagan's nomination because they didn't like him. They wanted uh, George H. W. Bush or a more moderate nominee uh, to to. Uh, they wanted a more nom- moderate nominee, and they presented this dossier to Ben Bradley, yeah. uh, who investigated it. He, who, sorry, Ben Bradley, the, Washington the legendary executive editor of the Washington Post, yeah. who published the Watergate stories of Woodward and Bernstein. And he assigned Bob Woodward to look into this, along with a number of other reporters. And they did look into it, and they ended up not. They en- they ended up interviewing a number of of people, and they did discover that there were some gay men who worked for Ronald Reagan, but they could not piece together any sort of kind of conspiracy as, as, as these congressmen were alleging. And the Post never published anything about this. And yeah. I, um, and so I uncovered this uh, in Ben Bradley's papers. His papers are at the University of Texas. And there was a folder in, in containing all the notes of this investigation mm. and transcripts of interviews and uh, this 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 dossier that they compiled and gave to Ben Bradley it was all sitting there, and I and I pieced together the the story, and yeah, it was probably the biggest I would say the biggest revelation in my book, um, just in terms of kind of the news value of it, and um, yeah, I think it would make a great series, and you know, from your mouth to uh, the studio executives' ears, they're not really listening to us right now, unfortunately, because. There's, Not that we know of. Ted, well, Sar- Ted Sarandos is a huge fan of the Ogle. Well, podcast. I didn't mean that. I just meant in the sense that you know we're not oh. we're not we're not allowed to talk to them as writers yeah. right now. There's a strike going on. So yeah, and there's just you know what's going on in Hollywood right now is a uh, is a whole other conversation. But um, yeah, I'd love to see it on the screen. Someday. Yeah, the the fact that Ben Bradley chose not to publish it. Mm. Going back to the the pictures of Alsop being yeah. circulated after. Uh, you said it was like 20 years after or something. 15 and years or so, People yeah. chose not right. to publish that. Again, something that would never happen today. Ben Bradley, uh, you write that Bradley suppressed it, uh, saying rightly that a man's private sexual entanglements were his own affair. And it's, yeah. it's hilarious just cast against the willingness of people to share stories that are absolutely unfounded that have to do with other people's sexual affairs. Like it, it seems like it was a much classier time, a much, uh, you know, like 
do your job well, go home, you know, fuck a giraffe. Like, <laughs> is come in Monday and do a good job. Like, as, as long as you're doing that, who gives a shit? Yeah, but, I mean, yes and no. There were there were benefits to that. If you were heterosexual. If you were hetero, yeah. yeah. I mean, lots of gay people had their careers and, and lives destroyed in this period of time. Bradley's decision in this case, I think, was the right one. Uh, they discovered, yeah, there are a number of gay men, but crucially, none of these men were up for jobs in a potential Reagan administration where they would need a security clearance. Um, but there was, so so it wasn't really newsworthy in that sense. Um, but there was one man who was gay and would have probably had a serious job in the Reagan administration, but it ended up partly because of this brewing scandal. Um, the Reagan campaign basically told, basically uh, foreclosed the possibility of this person getting a job in the White House. Mm. I think because of the concern that that he was gay and that 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 might come out. So he he probably was was denied a job in the Reagan administration because of these ma ma these behind the scenes machinations. As a journalist, do you ever think? how you would have moved through the world back then as a gay man. It would have been extremely difficult. I mean, it wasn't until the 1980s that there was an openly gay reporter at a major American newspaper, Randy Schultz, the San Francisco Chronicle, who covered the AIDS crisis. That's um, insane. Yeah, you know, so there just weren't. And you, you could not, uh, you know, you couldn't have a career as an openly gay person in, in, in American journalism. I mean, there was, there was a lot of other, you know, there were, if you wanted to be openly gay, you could, you could, you could work for uh, an alternative newspaper or a gay, yeah. or a gay newspaper. And there were some great alternative newspapers and gay news, you know, gay journalistic outlets at that time, but your options were extremely limited. And yes, absolutely. I mean, doing this book, I realized how fortunate uh, I am to have been born at a time where uh, I've never really suffered career-wise yeah uh, for being gay I don't, I don't really think there's been any opportunity that i've uh, been denied solely on the basis of that i've been denied opportunities for other reasons but not because of not because i'm gay i don't think yeah was it the giraffes uh no just probably because <laughs> i'm a difficult person yeah well <laughs> you're a great writer so <laughs> Thank they, you. Should, they should put up Thank with you it. very much um you, you, the the better you are at something the more difficult you can be that's uh that's my uh, yeah, yeah, some, my viewpoint. Probably some truth to that. Yeah. Um, the uh, the archives I wanted to get into because mm. so much of this book does not come from online sources because oh, yeah. like like the story about uh, the the Reagan almost outing and, and Ben Bradley that was never published. That's not yep. going to be in any online archive. You have to actually go to yep. Texas, yep. dig through physical files. Yeah, and I'm assuming you went all over the country yep. um, internationally as well, or was it mostly in the uh, country? There were a couple of papers from uh, the UK archives that I used, but I was, I was, I was able to get those on. They, they did digitize them, fortunately, so I didn't have to, yeah. go, to go to London to get them. So. What, what, it, what is it like building an 800-page book, which I imagine was you know twice the size before you cut it down? What is it like mm -hmm. building a behemoth like that from essentially archives of history and like digging through, like you feel it, your hands are on like these physical yeah. files. The first big story I ever had as a journalist actually was based on archival research. It was uh, when I exposed the Ron Paul newsletters. Uh, mm. This was back in, in 2008 when he was running for president. And, um, you know, I was just fascinated by him as a character, as a, as a political figure and um, doing research, I read that when he was running for Congress at some point in the 90s, there had been a single issue of a newsletter that was very controversial and made some kind of racially inflammatory statements. Um, and I asked, well, where are the other issues of this newsletter? <laughs> it was mm. a newsletter. It was coming out on a regular yeah. basis. Why is there only one issue being quoted? Presumably, if they're making these you know, racist comments in one issue presumably there's lots of other stuff so i set about trying to find them and i did i found them in in archives at the university of kansas and the university of wisconsin had the full archive of the ron paul it went under different names the yeah. ron paul freedom Get Report. A pen name or something no oh. it was all written in his voice okay i don't think he actually wrote them himself most, I'm sure he wrote some of the items himself. Mm. They were probably written by this character named Lou Rockwell, who's kind of, of a weirdo libertarian right wing gadfly mm -hmm. out out down in Auburn, Miss Auburn, 
where's Auburn, Mississippi? Auburn, Auburn, Auburn uh, Alabama? Alabama. Alabama, yeah. Yeah, and uh, it was kind of conclusively proven that he was likely, most likely to be the guy to have written them. He was an aide to, to Paul. But yeah, these newsletters were published from 1978 on and off until the mid-90s, and um, they were just full of crazy garbage. I mean, I, I wrote this for the New Republic, and you can look it up. It's called Angry White Man, and we we, we posted a lot of the issues of, of the newsletter on online. He was making... You know, indulging these these crazy theories about AIDS being invented in a government lab, which were started by the Soviet Union. He was making inflammatory statements about gays, about Jews, mostly about blacks. Um, so I have, you know, so I've always had an interest in um, in archival research, and that was actually the most fun part of this book was was mm. was digging through archives and filing Freedom of Information Act requests. And yeah, it took a lot of um, a lot of time uh, and organization. You know, I had a very kind of meticulous um system just using files on my um computer and sort of breaking everything down first by decade and then kind of thematically yeah um you know like uh there's a certain scandal involving say a diplomat in the roosevelt administration that i would put everything regarding it in that folder or the david walsh mm. story that i talked about earlier yeah that was based largely on FBI records that were taken, because the FBI was involved in the investigation. Um, but there was also, uh, the, the New York Post was the newspaper that broke that story, that outed him. And the publisher of the New York Post at the time was a woman named Dorothy Schiff. Mm. And her papers at the New York Public Library, and she had hired a private investigator to look into this matter. And he f wrote this like 150-page report uh, where he had a whole team of private investigators going out and interviewing men who yeah. had some kind of interaction at this potential brothel, and so I used, you know, I used, uh, I used that. Um, but yeah, it was a, it, it involved a lot of organizing, um, uh, and yeah, it just, and it was a never-ending process. I was moving chapters, I was moving sections, I was moving paragraphs. I mean, it was just yeah. Just, I don't know how people wrote, wrote books before um, personal computers, before word processing. I cannot imagine having done this book it, on it, a typewriter. And you see all these books that were written on typewriters, and it just astounds me. Yeah. It astounds me. I, I just would have rather drunk cyanide than, than, <laughs> than, than, than write this book uh, yeah. on anything other than a word processor I can cut and paste. My God, yeah. my God, I just can't even imagine. The... Yeah, the, I'm trying to think. The last time I used a book for like any sort of report where it was exclusively with written sources it was probably, you know, eighth grade, something like 2007. Um, and it was always an annoyance. I, I would be like, why the fuck can't we just go online? Everything's online. I don't want to have to go in person yeah. and, and pick up, you know, the physical copies and, and make photocopies and all this shit. But now that I'm so far removed from that and that almost all the research I do is either if a guest is writing a book, I go through the book um, either on Kindle or the, I like going through the physical copy better. Mm. Um, but like all the articles online. And now that, now that I haven't done the exclusive print research in a while, I bet it feels very cool to go into these archives and touch the physical copies. Like you're, you're, touching a part of history oh uh, yeah almost no. like nicholas Tre uh not nicholas treasure <laughs> nicholas cage, cage yeah. <laughs> national treasure yeah. like you're just like holding like the the moment where you were holding that near ronald yeah. reagan outing in yeah. your hands and you're like holy fuck yeah, how like has striking, this never been reported yeah, it's like before? striking gold yeah like um, that must be so cool yeah. to experience and that. there was a similar uh when i i got a um an fbi file declassified on uh this man who worked for Lyndon Johnson named Robert Waldron, who was a gay man and whose career was basically destroyed because he was gay. And his story had never been told before. And there was uh, a lot of revelations in that file, not just about Waldron, but like basically there was the revelation that Waldron was setting up, was, was allowing LBJ to use his house to have sexual ass assignations with one of his secretaries. That was basically alluded to in one of these FBI files. Yeah, I mean, when you when you find stuff like that, that's that kind of really um, reminds you that this is this is what you're in this business for. Yeah, is to is to bring new light, bring new new evidence to bear. Yeah. So so as we end off, I, I wanted to ask you about um, th there is a quote from Dan Savage that you included in the 
the army hammer right up mm. but I, I think parallels secret city and the the army hammer case and and dan savage is a sex and sexual relations writer and podcaster um and in the article uh you quote him as saying these encounters and he's talking about army hammer these encounters illustrate the severe complications of being rich famous and kinky you can't put that on tinder because tmz's gonna come find you it's like kinky famous people today are where gay famous people were a generation or two ago as 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 a gay man who has just spent a lot of time with the the hidden gay people mm. in history and then you're also going through the the army hammer case where his kink or bdsm is uh you know it's it's nowhere near the same ballpark as uh homosexuality yeah. It, yeah. but it's seen as as taboo it's it's seen as like sort of this thing that you're not really allowed to to do especially if you're famous do, do you feel a sort of uh sympathy or camaraderie in any way with army hammer uh with what he's going through now having just done all of this research for the past decade on and how um homosexuals have been suppressed yeah i mean with with the stipulation as as you imply that they're really I don't want to draw moral equivalence between homosexuality which was which is just an orientation in the same way that heterosexuality is with kinks and there is actually this attempt that I don't like to kind of associate you know anyone now who has any kind of sexual kink is now apparently a part of the LGBTQIA plus community right which I which I, so see, pe people are equating a preference with a certain, identity yes okay. and I don't I don't want to draw that equivalence yeah, I, um, I wouldn't either. But a lot of people do now, apparently, because if you, you know, you go to the gay pride parade or you talk to people, you know, there are people who now say they're queer and they're not homosexual. They're just like into weird they, they sexual, like being tied up, whatever. Yeah. And that's fine. Again, it's fine. But I don't, no one's ever been legally oppressed for that in the way that gay people were. Right. So yeah. I don't want to draw that kind of moral equivalence. But yes, in the sense that um, Army Hammer and uh, yeah, was was being shamed in a kind of puritanical way in his 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 um his sexual desires and his his sex life was being subjected to uh the sort of scrutiny that was in some ways reminiscent of the way that gay people were talked about and i when i quoted uh um a, a producer howard rosenman who was a, a gay man was mm. in his 70s and you know was seen a lot in his life and and basically said that 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 he thought the um the the shaming the shaming that Ar that Army Hammer was being subjected to was was uh, sort of eerily reminiscent of of the shaming that a lot of gay men had to endure in their lives. And um, uh, talking to a lot of gay people about that story and about Army Hammer, I definitely did notice that there was, um, particularly among gay men, that there was a, a sympathy for him yeah. and a kind of understanding that what he was going through was was unfair. And I do think that uh, gay, gay <clears throat> I do think a lot of gay men feel that way and felt that way about this case because they had been subjected to kind of similar um, yeah. shaming because of their, um, you know, because of their sexual orientation. Yeah. I, I would say the other big difference between being into kink and being homosexual in terms of identity is that you can be formerly kinkish or <laughs> formerly into bdsm however you want you to can phrase move it but on. You can, yeah you, you can can't be like oh, i'm a former gay i well, mean people do they did used to that used to be a big but, thing the ex-gay movement they, they don't really exist anymore but they, yeah that was, no, that was a huge that was a huge abusive terrible um process you know the whole conversion therapy and i actually went to one of their uh camps once to interview people and it was it was horrifying uh Jesus. it shut down ex exodus international it was all most of them were kind of re re religiously influenced and this was a christian evangelical one um and yeah it was just it was really just a sad de depressing thing but they they shut down like maybe about a decade ago yeah and i just had a debate online with destiny and milo yiannopoulos and yeah. Of all people, uh, I would have never thought Milo Yiannopoulos would be the one trying to mainstream ex-gay therapy or like gay conversion it's, therapy. It's his, it's his latest grift. Yep. Um, so uh, the last thing I wanted to to ask you is, uh, you're you're such a a great writer and and you're you're so good at, at 
being a skeptic and it seems like walking through the world as a, a, a skeptic in the best sense of the word is something that you're uh, is a strong suit of yours how can people become better skeptics whether it's as a consumer or as a producer of content whether it's a podcast or writer how, how can you work on that skill and become more self-aware of uh, honing skepticism in your day-to-day life. I think reading uh, stuff, reading books, articles, writers who challenge your preconceived notions. You know, if you're a conservative, read liberals. If you're a liberal, read conservatives. That is the best way to challenge your own assumptions. Yeah. Um, and you know, you know, you might come away changing your mind about something, which is not necessarily a bad thing. It seems like we'll need randomized algorithms too. Things Pro- that'll yes. push more random things in yeah. front of people's faces or direct opposition. I to think, whatever. unfortunately, you have to do it largely on your own. You yeah, have, you have to go out and actively seek things that challenge you. Where's the best? Pe- uh, where's the best place for people to follow your writings and and social media postings? I don't, I'll, and I'll link this all. Yeah, to I don't the really. Episode d- as well. I guess most of the stuff I write ends up on Twitter under my Twitter account, Jay Kerchick. I'm not an active Twitter user, though. But if I write something, you can probably find it there. I also have a website, uh, jameskirchick.com, which I which I do try to update. Yeah. And, and of course, the Army Hammer article will be linked for those of you listening and watching. Please go check out Secret City. Uh, I, I don't usually dive into history books, and I get bored of them after 30, 40 pages. And... I tore through uh, over half of this book within a week, which is very quick for me. And I still have to finish like the the last 300 pages. <laughs> but like I burned through almost 500 pages in under a week and I'm a wow. slow reader. So it, it's it, the I thought it would be hard to follow with all of the names in the mm. beginning. But you do a really good job of laying out the timeline and referring back to the the, the origins of people and which uh which uh, campaign or presidency they were a part of. It wasn't hard to follow at all. And it's very uh, enticing and, and exciting to read. So thank you so much. I James really Kerchick, that. thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thanks, Zach. I appreciate it. Thank you. Oh.